Hello, my name is Ian McCall, and this is my take on the Medical Student Core Curriculum Module on Childhood Atopic Dermatitis from the American Academy of Dermatology. Basically, after completing this module, the learner will be able to identify and describe the morphology of atopic dermatitis. Morphology means what does it look like? Basically, it's a red scaly disease, and in any dermatitic process, you've usually got some small erosions. In other words, there's small erosions in the surface from which fluid may come out. This is part of the spongiotic fluid, the fluid that's between the cells of the epidermis in any dermatitic or eczematous process. Recognize that superficial infections often complicate atopic dermatitis. Indeed, they do. Uh, staph infection is certainly the most prominent thing. And the other thing that can sometimes complicate atopic dermatitis is superinfection with herpes virus. Recommend an initial treatment plan for a child with atopic dermatitis. Well, that's important because we can't cure this condition. We can control it. So you've got to know the main things that you're going to try and control and you've got to make sure the patient uh, or the parent understands them. Yeah, provide the parent uh, about uh, with some education about daily skin care for a child with atopic dermatitis because these kids have dry skin. They need their skin moisturized every day. So there is a daily skin care routine that you have to know about. Determine when to refer a patient with atopic dermatitis to a dermatologist. Well, if you're really running into trouble, if they've got recurrent infections, if they ever get herpes virus superimposed, uh, those would be the main circumstances. But we'll see what they say. <coughs> the first case is a 10-month-old girl itchy red rash for the last seven months. So it started when she was about three months of age, which is common with atopic dermatitis. The rash waxes and wanes, as it always does. It's involving a face. And it's always more difficult when it's involving a face. You can't avoid it. Carlin's bath daily using normal soap. Now, all soaps are uh, degreasing agents. So you know, if you're using just a, a common soap or tar soaps, they're all degreasing agents. And a kid with atopic dermatitis already has problems with dry skin, so you don't want to degrease them. Sometimes they use moisturizing lotion if their skin appears dry. Lotions are never the best. You're usually better with creams or ointments. They recently introduced peas into a diet. I wonder whether this may be contributing to the rash. Well, dietary factors seldom play a big part. We'll come into that. Normal birth history, healthy, aside from an episode of uh, wheezing five months of age. You want to know the circumstances. She's starting to develop a bit of asthma. Might have just been viral. No medications, no allergies known. This is the important bit, the family history. The mother has asthma and allergic rhinitis. If both parents have manifestations of atopy, by atopy we mean asthma, eczema and hay fever. But if both parents have it, you can rest assured the child's going to get problems. They live in a house with her parents. Uh, no pets, that's important. Cats, horses, particular source of uh, allergens in children with atopic dermatitis. Itches all night. Well, that's really a problem. When they're itching, they're not sleeping. And that usually means the parents aren't sleeping as well. So it's a common reason for parents to bring the child. How would you describe a skin exam? Well, it's a red scaly rash. You can see the little erosions here. If you look carefully, there may even be slight crusts where, you know, there's been exudation that's dried up in the surface of the skin. But if you've got skin broken like this with crusts, you're almost certainly going to get a bit of secondary infection there as well. The area around the mouth is spared. It's mainly the cheeks. They're saying erythematous ill-defined plaques. Okay, a patch is flat, a plaque is raised and has some thickness associated with it, with overlying scale and crust. I would have mentioned about these little erosions here too. What elements in the history are important? 
have to ask in this case. Does she scratch or rub her skin? Well, you're certainly going to ask that. She almost certainly does. Does the rash keep her awake at night? That's important. It's functionally important with any atopic to know if that's the case. If, if they don't sleep properly, they get stressed and it makes their skin worse. Which moisturizers are used and where? Yeah, you want to know what someone's putting on and you want to know if when they're putting it on and where they're putting it should be all over. So the correct answer to this is going to be all of the above. <coughs> okay. What's the most likely diagnosis given the history and skin exam findings? Well, we've got the kids starting with this at the age of three. It's chronic. We've got the mother who's atopic. We've got the kid itching all the time and keep awake at night. So atopic dermatitis is by far the likeliest diagnosis. Contact dermatitis. Well, if, if a rash is just localized to one area, you always have to think of a contact dermatitis. And occasionally in atopics, you'll get an element of contact on the face um, if they're reacting to certain foods. But it's often circumoral as well. Could it be psoriasis? You don't get psoriasis much in the face. It's the wrong distribution. Scabies? Again, you don't get scabies in the face. Very, very young children. You might immunosuppress patients, you will. But uh, you don't normally get scabies in the face. Seborrheic dermatitis, you certainly get that in the face. But it's usually in the nasolabial folds, eyebrows, just in the, the root of the nose. And it's a fine, greasy scale. It's not like that. Um, Ten-month-old with sebderm, usually they'd have it younger than that. They'd usually have it in the scalp. They'd have cradle cap and all the rest. So, in essence, the diagnosis is atopic dermatitis. So, yeah. Which of the following statements supports the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis? Chronic nature of the rash certainly does. Distribution? Yep. They'll uh, probably go into this aspect of distribution. Distribution varies a little bit with age. Often in young children it is in the face. Sometimes at the antecubital fossa and behind the knees as well. But that's more common in adolescents. Family history of atopic disease? Yep. Symptoms of pruritus? Yep. So the correct answer is all of the above. So they're saying the basics. It's a chronic pruritic inflammatory skin disease with a wide range of severity. Indeed it is. It is chronic. Um, certainly itchy. There's a varying degree of inflammation. And the severity ranges dramatically. You can have some people with just a little bit at the front of the elbows and behind the knees. Others uh, presenting with a red, irritated skin all over, often with chronic oozing. And uh, they can be sorely afflicted by it. It's one of the most common skin disorders in developed countries. Up to 20% of children. That's changed dramatically in the last few years. And there's a few reasons for that. It used to be about 5%. But it's now up to about 20%, and it's related to the way in which we mollycoddle and protect children and don't expose them to allergens. Their immune system doesn't develop normally. They develop in, uh, in such a form as to get hypersensitivity reactions. Kids really should get exposed to bacteria and various other things early on for their immune system to develop normally. But note that only 1% to 3% of adults have atopic dermatitis, which suggests that it's going to get better. I'm surprised at that figure. I thought it would have been higher. You know, often in adults, it's going to present as a hand dermatitis um, because there's a disorder of barrier function in atopic dermatitis. They don't have a normal barrier function. The stratum corneum is abnormal. So their skin tends to dry out and the skin's hyper irritable. And adults, when they're doing a lot of wet work, uh, mothers with young children or people employed as mechanics and the like and using degreases in their hand, if they've had any tendency to atopic uh, dermatitis when they were younger, that's when it's going to come out again. So I think the figure probably is a bit higher than that. In most patients, atopic dermatitis develops before the age of five. And that's true. In fact, it often develops in the first year of life. I think 30% of them will. And typically clears by adolescence. All right. It often gets better around puberty, um, whether that's related to you know, the onset of uh, hormones and grease gland function, the skin is less dry, I'm not sure. 
then it tends to flare again in late, um, late teenage years. Primary symptom is pruritus. That's true. The main issue with atopic dermatitis is itch, the skin itches. And then they rub and scratch it. And it's that rubbing and scratching that induces a lot of the changes that you see in atopic dermatitis. Um, you can excoriate the skin. If you rub skin hard over a period of time, it lichenifies, it thickens. You see prominent skin surface markings in lichenified skin. So some people will get that front of the legs, um, behind the neck. What else? Atopic dermatitis is often called the itch that rashes. Yeah, that's what they mean. It's the rubbing and scratching that induces a lot of the changes. Scratching to relieve atopic dermatitis associated with the itch gives rise to the itch scratch cycle. Yep, that's when you get lichen simplex chronicus, uh, that thickened skin that you tend to get in the front of the shins. You see that more in adults, actually, than you do in children. Patients experience periods of remission and exacerbation. Yeah, it waxes and wanes, just in, as in the history of uh, this child. So that's one of the problems about patients thinking that something they've just put on is important and getting it better, or some dietary alteration that they've made um, seems to have made it better. It may just be part of that waxing and waning that's uh, so common in this condition. Clinical findings. <coughs> Lesions begin as erythematous papules, coalesce to form erythematous plaques, may display weeping, crusting, or scale. Remember that weeping is due to the spongiosis, the separation by fluid of the cells of the keratinocytes and epidermis. And if those little fluid things join up, they'll weep on the surface. On the hands, for instance, where the skin is very thick, where the stratum corneum is very thick, sometimes the little fluid vesicles can't break out onto the surface. So you see them as uh, like tapioca pudding, little clear vesicles under the skin. Very itchy, though. Overlying layer of skin in the hands then will just peel for certain. Distribution and involvement of atopic dermatitis varies by age. Now, that, that really is uh, important. <coughs> it does. You've got to be aware of the different patterns associated with age. Here we go, infants and toddlers, mainly on the cheeks, as in this case, forehead, scalp, and extensor surfaces. You know, the extensor surfaces may be related to the, the little sods getting out in the, on the um, carpets and crawling. So it's the extensor surfaces of the arms and the legs that will tend to get irritated. Because the skin is not only dry, it's hyper-irritable, it can be irritated very easily. Older children, maybe like kinified, that's just where it's thickened, you know, more prominent surface markings of the skin because of chronic rubbing. Examitous plaques in flexural areas of the neck, elbows, wrists and ankles. Front of the ankles gives problems. Uh, front of the wrists, certainly the elbows behind the knees. In adults, like kinification of the flexural regions, again they're talking there mainly of the um, front of the elbows and behind the, the knees. Because if you're talking of other flexural areas, you know, in the groin or under the armpits, you don't get atopic dermatitis there so much, simply because they're moister areas. They don't dry out as much. They're seeing involvement of the hand, certainly in adults, that's just because of irritants, soap detergents wrists, ankles, feet, face. Yeah, you'll see a few adults. <coughs> I'm not sure if they're transmitting things up to their face, you know, transferring some irritant up there, or they just tend to rub more and will get it. Uh, women put a lot of cosmetics on, some of which they may have developed. Some may act as irritants, and some they may have developed an allergic contact dermatitis too. Xerosis is a common characteristic of all stages. All that means is dryness of the skin. And typically, um, if the stratum corneum dries, it cracks. So you'll see these cracks, particularly on the hands, particularly on the feet. And there's a condition called astiototic eczema, where, uh, especially seen in the elderly, where the skin cracks on the front of the shins as a crazy paving. Now, if you're showering excessively, using a lot of soap and detergents in your skin, you just take the fats out of it, just dry and crack on you. So it's more common in those circumstances. 
What percentage of children with atopic dermatitis will also have or will develop asthma or allergic rhinitis? Ooh, it's quite high. Not all of them. I don't think it's that high. It's either these two, 30 to 50 or 50 to 80. I'd probably have gone for the 30 to 50. Nope, wrong. 50 to 80 will have another atopic disease. Well, you want to try and stop that. I mean, this is the whole business of trying to stop atopic dermatitis. There's a thing called the atopic march. I don't know if they'll go on to it. But that's where kids get atopic dermatitis first. Then they go on and develop asthma and hay fever. But the theory is that if you can control their atopic dermatitis, then they're much less likely to go on and develop the other conditions. Because the atop, the, say the asthma, for instance, it would appear as if dust mite and other allergens actually have to enter across the skin first um, for them to develop hypersensitivity. And then when they breathe the stuff in uh, and it goes into their airways, boom, that's when it causes marked edema, vasoconstriction there. So if we can control atopic dermatitis in children and do it well, then you may not get that much. So I don't know. We've got to try and knock this figure down. Okay, this is an infants and toddlers, affects the cheeks, the forehead, the scalp, and extends the surfaces. Okay. Erythematous ill-defined plaques with overlying scale encrusting, erythematous ill-defined plaques on the lateral lower leg with overlying scale. Yeah. You know, they're almost like discoid eczema lesions. They're coin-shaped or discoid-shaped lesions on the lower legs there. So little kids can develop discoid eczema as well. And there's the rash on the, the face here. If there had been a food allergy element, that area around there would be a lot more involved. There's the typical picture. Take the clothes off a kid with atopic eczema, and the first thing they do is start to scratch. You can see how he's really getting stuck into this with white um, uh, just just the force that he's applying to his skin there. That's like in if I see those increased skin markings there? That's like in a with some little crusts where the skin has been excoriated. Older children affects the flexural areas of the neck, elbows, knees, wrists and ankles. Yeah, typically behind here and here. May not see that as much in young children. Um, there's a fair degree of overlap, obviously. So, like kenified erythematous plaques behind the knees, erythematous excoriated papules with overlying crust in the antecubital fossa. You know, whenever you get crusts and the like like that, I usually associate that with secondary staph infection. Look at it carefully and you can see if there are any little pustules and the like. You might have expected a bit more, actually, if that, if that was truly infected. So what's the difference between eczema and dermatitis? Well, you know, I sometimes regard them as synonymous, but eczema as a non-specific term refers to a group of inflammatory skin conditions. So we have seborrheic eczema, but mind you, we still call it seborrheic dermatitis. Um, atopic dermatitis is different, or is a specific type of eczematous dermatitis characterized by the features we've been talking about and the fact that it's genetic and it's seen in individuals with a history of asthma, eczema, and if even a family history of that. The cause of atopic dermatitis is multifactorial, not completely understood. True, but we're learning a lot more about it. Um, genetics, we've said, are important, obviously, with family history. If both parents are atopic or have atopic disorders, you can rest assured the kid's going to get at least one of the three maybe all three. This is important. Skin barrier dysfunction. There's a little um, protein in the stratum granules on the very second top layer of the skin that produces a substance, well that layer of stratum granules produces a substance called filigrin. And filigrin forms part of the structure, the, break, the, the skeleton of the stratum corneum. But breakdown products of filigrin also form natural moisturizing factor and other other um, moisturizing factors that, that 
give you the normal skin barrier. There are other substances called ceramides. They are fat molecules <coughs> that are uh, in between the interstices of the keratin molecules uh, in the stratum corneum. So kids with atopic dermatitis, they don't have normal filigan function there. They have gene mutations in that. And so they have this skin barrier function, uh, dysfunction. So the skin can dry out more, it can be irritated more easily. They have an impaired immune response. <clears throat> well, that's true. They've got an impaired T-cell immune response, and that's reflected in their increased uh, risk of getting viral infections and fungal infections. You know, if a, an atopic gets uh, Veruca vulgaris, gee, they have a hard time trying to get rid of it. Um, because, the, you know, all the things you do to irritate the virus to try and get an immune reaction, these kids can't get a normal immune reaction. And environmental factors play a big part in atopic dermatitis. Anything that dries out the air, you know, you're losing water vapor from your skin to the surrounding air all the time. So anything that dries out the air, you know, using air conditioning, putting a heating, a heating system on, central heating system on in winter, dries out the air, bang. You lose a lot more water vapor from the skin to the surrounding air, and the atopics will all start. The skin um, uh, humidity will drop to a certain level, and they'll all start itching, and then they scratch, and then the barriers functions disrupted even more. So genetics, abnormal skin barrier function, an impaired immune response, and environmental factors, they all play a, f a, fa a part in atopic dermatitis. Which of the following recommendations would you provide to Carmen's parents? That's the little girl with the rash on her cheeks. Daily or twice daily application of moisturizing ointment or cream. Mm, sounds like a good idea. Normally you need it twice daily. Um, hydrocortisone ointment to the face twice daily. Well, so long as that face isn't, uh, isn't oozing, then an ointment's okay. Here in Australia, we only have 1% <coughs> hydrocortisone. So, uh, this 2.5% uh, is fine, apply it twice daily. Yep. Hydroxyzine, it's an antihistamine at bedtime. Well, all right, you're basically using that just as a sedative. I mean, the itch in atopic dermatitis, you actually analyze it. Um, it's now thought that really um, histamine doesn't play a big part in this itch. At all. There's a whole variety of other factors that are involved in itch. So if you're giving them one of these, it's basically just to sedate them. I don't think it plays a big part in handling the itch at all. A mild cleanser as little as needed to remove dirt. Well, use a soap substitute of some sort. So yep, I would have thought all of those would be reasonable things to recommend to the parents. Increase the moisturizing, a bit of hydrocortisone ointment to suppress that dermatitic process. That if she needs to sleep because the big problem that they came with was she wasn't sleeping. And uh, a soap substitute to to wash with rather than soap itself. So all of the above would be the correct answer. Yep. Carolyn is having an exacerbation of her AD and needs both gentle skin care and treatment of the inflammation in her skin. Sure. So that's why you're using the soap substitute and that's why you're using the, the hydrocortisone. I might have looked at that face and wondered also if there was a bit of secondary infection there. Um, and if I thought there was with that crusting and any sign of pustules, I'd actually add in a wee bit of Bactroban and Mupiricin ointment as well. Give that with the hydrocortisone. You know, most atopics, the skin's broken and they've got crust. They're going to have some secondary infection. So there's nothing wrong with a bit of Bactroban in there as well. Combination of short-term treatment to manage flares. Yep. That's what you're trying to do with your hydrocortisone and your antibacterials. And then longer term strategies to help control the symptoms between flares. All right, there's, this, is, this is where the art of this comes. You know, what are your longer term strategies going to be? Well, remember, you've got dry skin, so you're going to have to moisturize it. You've got hyper irritable skin, so you're going to have to keep anything away from the skin that's going to irritate it. And it'll be irritated by wool, by sand and sand pits, by bubble baths, by perfumes topically. So, you know, chlorine and chlorinated swimming pools. So you've got to go through the lifestyle, how the kid runs its life, what it does, what, what its uh, hobbies are, if it's a bit older. Um, 
and go over all of this with a mother and try and see where the, the uh, other potential exposure to irritants are that are going to keep the skin flared. Recommend gentle skin care too. You know, you don't need uh, soap to wash. You can uh, have relatively short uh, showers or short baths anyway. Do you put an oil in there? You know, there's things like alpha carry bath oil and various others. You can. There's, I've got no problems with that. You can then bring them out and uh, pat them dry and get your moisturizer on. You've got to get your moisturizer on straight away, within two or three minutes, or else the skin tends to dry out. Tepid baths without washcloths or brushes. You, know, you don't need it too hot. Don't rub them too much. Certainly don't use brushes on them. Mild soaps? Well, I'd use soap substitutes. You know, they talk of Dove soap and uh, the like as a mild soap, but honestly, I'd use other soap substitutes. Cetaphil soap substitutes, QV soap substitutes. Pat them dry. Yeah, don't rub them. Pat them dry. Then use an emollient. Um, you know, petrol atoms quite thick. Uh, you're not going to use that if they've got awfully, awfully dry skin. I, as far as moisturizers go, um, glycerin and sorbeline has a lot going for it. You've just got to get one that doesn't have propylene glycol in it. It's going to irritate them. Um, some of the Sorry, I'm just having a mental block there just now. The Aveno, the oatmeal type preparations, or Dermavine, they're quite useful moisturizers as well. QV produce a, a wide variety of moisturizers. They're saying use ointments or thick creams, no watery lotions. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You really need something like this to moisturize. Apply once or twice daily to the whole body within three minutes of bathing for optimal occlusion. Yeah, that's important. So trap the water in there. Identification, avoidance of triggers and irritants. Yeah, we talked about that. Wool and acrylic fabrics. Treat acute inflammation with topical steroids. You know, don't be frightened of using topical steroids. They're the best anti-inflammatories that we have. They shut off prostaglandin production. Um, they reduce the influx of white cells into these lesions. They really are... Um, uh, they stabilize mast cells as well, if you think histamine plays a part in any of this. So they really are important in shutting off the inflammatory process. Um, and even with steroids, they're saying ointments are preferred over creams. Yeah, but if, the, if it's oozing, you're going to have to use a steroid cream. Uh, you won't get an ointment to stick in those circumstances. Low potency is usually effective for the pain. Um, obviously, they've got 2.5% in the States. We've only got 1% here. I'll occasionally use some Advantan, uh, methylprednisolone ointment at night, maybe for three nights, just to shut this off and then get them on 1% hydrocortisone. Body and extremities often require medium potency. Now there we're talking things like Celestone or Advantan, as, um, a bit of Advantan, um, or Aristocort, you know, Tramcinolone type ointments. Again, you don't need to use them for long. There's an art to, to using topical steroids. Generally, you suppress the inflammation by using them once or twice daily for three or four days to get it all down. Then you back off. You just moisturize, and you wait and see how long they go before it flares again. They're saying using stronger steroids for short periods and milder steroids for maintenance helps reduce the risk of steroid atrophy and other side effects. Yeah, true. Potential local side effects associated with steroids include striae, uh, stretch marks. That's really only going to be if you're sticking them in flexures. That way you shouldn't be using a strong fluorinated steroid anyway. Telangiectasia, again, uh, mainly on the face if you overuse them. But you'll generally get a, an acne or a rosacea type picture as well. Skin atrophy, again, it has to be a strong fluorinated steroid or you're using it in a, an occlusive surface, like under breasts, in the groin, in the armpit. If you do that with a strong fluorinated steroid, sure, you'll get some atrophy. But it takes a wee while, you know, at least three weeks or so of using it um, to do that. Short term, you're not going to get it. And acne, well, acne or rosacea, you can certainly get. And then, so we've been treating the acute inflammation with this lot. Then we've said, what are you going to treat the flares with? These are these topical calcineurin inhibitors. They go by the name of um, pimecrolimus and tacrolimus. 
uh, here in Australia, Pimic line, this is called Elidel, and Tacra line, was we don't have yet, but overseas it's called Protopic. They prevent flares. They don't really shut off um, an inflammatory uh, flare. They actually can, but it takes a while. You use the steroid to shut the, the flare off and then use this to try and stop an area flaring. You know, if they have particular tendencies to flare on the cheeks or um, at the front of the elbows or behind the knees, then once you've suppressed it, you can use this to try and stop it flaring. So they're used uh, when continued use of topical steroids is ineffective or when the use of topical steroids is inadvisable. Um, certainly in flexural areas it's inadvisable, but as I've said before, you don't usually get it in the main flexural areas. Sure, you get it in the flexes of the elbows and the knees, but they're not occluded all the time. This I uh, would disagree with. Um, they're saying antihistamines help to break the scratch cycle. I think they just sedate you. Um, H1 antihistamines, hydroxyzine are helpful. Well. Treat coexisting skin infections, systemic antibiotics. I still think you can use topical antibiotics. Bactroban I find quite use, useful, mepiracin. But I mean, if someone's red all over and oozing all over, then certainly you need systemic antibiotics. And then they're saying, when should patients be referred to a dermatologist? Patients who have recurrent skin infections. Okay, that's true. Um, Mind you, you, nowadays we use dilute bleach baths for kids in this sort of circumstance, and it, it works wonders. Um, if you read the rest of uh, my own tutorials, you'll find the business of bleach baths explained there. Um, would you refer... The other thing, by the way, if you've got uh, a kid under one with recurrent skin infections and severe atopic dermatitis, they may have some syndromes. There's a thing called Job syndrome, the hyper IgE syndrome. There's the um, Wiscott Aldridge syndrome. There's a few others where uh, recurrent skin infections occur in association with atopic dermatitis. Oops, go back. Refer patients who have extensive and or severe disease. Well, fair enough. If you're having trouble trying to manage it, then certainly refer them. Um, occasionally, even some children who have very severe disease where it's not coming under control. They may need systemic therapy with drugs such as Imuran. Um, so you would want to refer that to a dermatologist. Or in circumstances where symptoms are poorly controlled with topical steroids. Well, you certainly want to ask why. You know, I think putting it on. You know, one of the big issues in all dermatology is compliance. Um, and it's, it's quite time consuming for a mother to apply creams all the time to a kid. Uh, it, it really does require a lot of time, so just make sure that it's being done. You know, how do you do that? Well, if you ask them if they're doing it, of course they'll say they are. But you can look at the amount of cream that they've used over a certain period of time, and that can give you an idea of uh, you know how much they uh, whether they've been putting it on as you've uh, as you've asked. If you've only given them a small amount of cream, they've still got some left, then you know they haven't been putting it on the way you said. Maybe you should have given them an adequate amount of cream in the first place. What's the most likely steroid you would choose for Carlin's facial lesions? Well, I think they've said a bit of uh, hydrocortisone ointment before, didn't they? 2.5%. Triamcinolone, that's a stronger mid-potency steroid. Uh, uh, you wouldn't want to use that in the face for any length of time. That is a strong fluorinated steroid. We don't have it in Australia, but... In the States, clobetazole, I think, is the strongest of the fluorinated steroids. You have certainly wouldn't want to use that in the face. And flucinonide is, uh, is another pretty strong high-potency steroid. Okay. So, hydrocortisone ointment, indeed. You can hear we're having a little storm in the background just now. Um... This is just, there you go, clobetazole is a super high potency steroid. This is a high potency steroid. These are your aristocorts, um, same sort of strength as, say, uh, canalone or betnovate, 0.02%. Uh, um, we don't have this one in Australia. Certainly have hydrocortisone. We do have desinide, but I don't use it a lot. Yeah. Remember, this, don't look at the percentages. 
these are different molecules. Hydrocortisone is a different molecule from clobetazole. This is well, must be probably about 100 times stronger than hydrocortisone. Um, so forget the percentages. Forget the, the, the they're just not relevant. It's the molecule whether it's a fluorinated steroid or not. This is another thing that's important. Triamcinolone ointment is stronger than triamcinolone cream or lotion because of the nature of the vehicle. The more occlusive the vehicle, if it's in an ointment base, generally it's uh, going to improve its absorption. Which of the following prescriptions should be used to treat carbonus for a three-month duration? Well, do -do -do -dum, how do you work that out? It's just on a face. And if you take, if you look at that, if you took a hand and put it over a face, it would sort of cover both cheeks. So two hands um, would cover her face. Now, a hand, a palm of one hand represents usually 1%. So she's got about 2% of her body surface that needs to be treated. Um, if you are giving a fingertip unit, now, a fingertip unit is the amount of cream from a 5 millimeter nozzle that uh, would go from the tip to the, the first crease in your finger. That fingertip unit will cover, uh, I think it's about 1%, or is it 2? Fingertip unit will cover about 2%, sorry, of the body surface. So she's having to treat 2% of the body surface, and she's having to treat it twice daily. So that'll be 0.5 of a gram times 2. So 1 gram she's going to need each day. So she's going to need 30 grams for a month. So she's going to need 90 grams for three months. And we said we're going to give her the ointment. So it's this one, hydrocortisone ointment, 90 grams. You would hope, you know, you'd hope that she's going to get better in three months. This is assuming the stuff's going on every day. Now, it's assuming it's not going to be better. So I'm not sure if I would actually give as much as that. I would expect the kid to get better in that time. Let's see what they say, though. Yep, there you go. 2% of the uh, body surface area. Uh, equals 30 grams for one month, so they're saying 90 grams. Ointment's more occlusive. I don't think I'd give that much. I'd probably have given 30 grams, maybe one repeat, and said, you know, if you're still in trouble, you've got to come back and see me. So what's the issue about topical steroid dosing in children? Low potency or safe when used for short intervals? Yes, probably even for long intervals. They can cause side effects when used for extended durations. Look, 1% hydrocortisone isn't going to cause any problems, even when it's used for long intervals. We stick it on babies' bottoms for quite some time, and on faces if we need to. High-potency steroids must be used with caution and vigilant clinical monitoring for side effects in children. Too true. If you're putting a high-potency fluorinated steroid on a kid, remember young children, have a large body surface area relative to their body weight. So they can absorb these high steroids, um, the high potency steroids, quite significantly. And you can get, you know, suppression of the corticoadrenal axis um, by using them. And especially if you're going to use them under occlusion. Um, sometimes they have a, a thing called wet dressings that are used in children to um, stop them scratching the skin to improve the absorption of the steroid. But uh, if you're using a high-potency steroid in those circumstances, you can increase the absorption dramatically. Potent steroids should be avoided in high-risk areas, such as the face, the folds, or occluded areas, such as under the diaper. OK, yes, you certainly don't want to use them on the face. We've talked about telangiectasia and acne and rosacea. You don't want to use them in occlusive folds. But remember, you don't get a lot of atopic dermatitis and occlusive folds. Um, and this business here, occluded areas such as under the diaper. Well, again, atopics. If you've got an atopic babe and it's got a lot of rash under its diaper, you'd wonder if it's atopic dermatitis or something else because usually that area is nice and moist and it's usually protected and it's usually the one area that's spared relative to the rest of the skin because one, they can't get at it and scratch it and two, 
it's much more um, moist. So, parent education and written instructions are the key to success. Yeah, this bit's probably important. You know, parents can't remember everything. There's a lot of stuff you're throwing at them, and I keep repeating it when I uh, do a consultation. But it's a good idea to write things down. Action plans provide parents and caregivers with easy to follow treatment recommendations. That's where we look. Oh, what have they got? Um, eczema action plan. Green regular daily care. All right. We'll look through that. It's just bathing, mild soap, well Cetaphil cleansers. Aveeno is the uh, one of the oatmeal ones. Um, and give them, tell them how often to put the moisturizer on, tell them to do it right away, pat the skin dry. Uh, mild symptoms of rash and itching, use lower strength medications. Yep, all of this plus um, yeah, a wee bit of hydrocortisone, perhaps a bit of Celestone M cream. Uh, not so sure about the antihistamines at night. Then if you've got red flaring, severe symptoms of rash and itching, use the higher strength medications. Well, certainly all the usuals, plus, what are they saying? You've just got to decide which steroids you're going to use here, whether you're going to use a topical Bactroban, or Mepiracin, whether you're going to use some oral antibiotics. Um, And then if you're, you, if you're having to do red zone medications for more than one to two weeks, you need to see a doctor at least every two to three months. Well, you'd wonder why you weren't settling. You'd probably want to see it more frequently than four monthly. Carlin's parents would also like more information regarding the association between food allergies and atopic dermatitis. What can you tell them? A positive allergen test proves that the allergy is clinically relevant. Oh, what sort of positive allergen test? You're going to do a RAS test? You're going to do a prick test? I don't think it matters. Neither of them prove that an allergy is clinically relevant. The test doesn't. Elimination of food allergens in patients with AD and confirmed food allergy will not lead to clinical improvement. Um, uh, well, Sometimes it does, actually. Um, I'm not sure that I'd agree completely with that. A lot of times it doesn't. You've really got to challenge them and see. Um, you've got to eliminate the food. The skin has to improve. You've got to challenge them. It has to get bad again. You've got to eliminate again. It's got to improve again. And it's got to flare again when you challenge them. In other words, you've got to have a double challenge like that. Food allergy is the more likely trigger if the onset or worsening of it correlates with exposure to the food. I think that's fair. We've often said that, you know, you give a child some egg or peanut or something and their skin goes bright red within half an hour of taking the, the food, then I think that that tends to indicate that food allergy is significant. Uh, and the last bit, there's no correlation between atopic dermatitis and food allergies. Well, that's wrong. There is. So what are they saying? Um, yeah, food allergy is more likely to trigger the onset of worsening if it correlates with exposure to the food. The role of allergy remains controversial. Too true. Many patients with AD have sensitization to food and environmental allergens. Well, they often do, especially the environmental. I mean, virtually every atopic will show uh, positive reactions to dust mite. Many will show positive reactions to animal danders, uh, horses. Um, many will show some sporadic food allergies or perhaps sporadic uh, grass pollen allergies without necessarily having allergic rhinitis or anything like that. Evidence of allergen sensitization, that means positive test, is not proof of a clinically relevant allergy. Too true. Food allergy as a cause or for exacerbating factor for atopic dermatitis is uncommon. Um, I think that's true. Uh, we used to say only about 10% of atopics would have any uh, hint of a food allergy at all, and probably only 10% of that 10% would actually have a significant food allergy. 
Now they're saying identification of these should be reserved for refractory ADN children in whom the suspicion for a food allergy is high. Sure, you know, the, these are the ones where, you know, the mother's saying, when I feed him such and such, within half an hour he goes red all over, starts scratching his skin, occasionally even wheezy, so when you get a history like that, it certainly would be relevant, so you'd want to have um, eliminate it from the diet. The question of whether you want to eliminate cow's milk uh, or the like is one that shouldn't be taken um, lightly. You got to have good evidence that that's the case before you take a child off some of its basic foods. Infants with ADN food allergy may have additional findings that suggest the presence of food allergy, such as vomiting, or if it goes red all over and vomits, has diarrhea. And if there's failure to thrive, you know, if they're getting diarrhea, they're vomiting, they're, the child just isn't thriving, then sure, in those circumstances, food allergy, mind you, it may not be food allergy. The kid may have lactose intolerance or something like that. Um, but it suggests that a dietary factor may be playing a part or they have a dietary problem. Elimination of food allergens in patients with AD and confirmed food allergy can lead to clinical improvement. Yeah, it can. So second case, ah, an older one, 10-year-old girl. Her atopic dermatitis is normally well controlled with emollients, occasional topical steroids. She's now got an itchy red rash in the back of her thighs. Past history of atopic dermatitis. Hydrocortisone 2.5% ointment, no allergies, no known ones anyway. Little sister has atopic dermatitis. Little sister might also have had asthma, hay fever, you know, mother would have, you would look, you'd expect one of the parents to have some form of ATP as well. Lives in a house with parents and sister, attends fourth grade, favourite subject of school is spelling. No fevers. Okay. That's the top of the thighs in the buttock area. Um, that's certainly red, excoriated, some crusting papules, some of which have joined up. Looks a bit infected to me. Multiple erythematous papules and plaques with erosions. Yeah, remember the little erosions are the important element in diagnosing atopic dermatitis. What's your next step in the evaluation of her? You're going to apply a potent topical steroid. Well, what do they want to see? They want, what's your next step in the evaluation of a, well, the treatment? You're going to apply a potent topical steroid. Well, she's been using 2.5 hydrocortisone. You might want to use something a bit more potent to get it settled, but that's not part of the evaluation. Do you want to obtain a skin bacterial culture? I mean, normally I'd just assume that there's infection there. I probably would do a swab though. Want to do a skin biopsy? Well, no, I mean, I know it's, a, it's clinically it's atopic dermatitis. I really don't need to biopsy it to find that out. You want to start topical antibiotics? Yeah, I might. Um, because there might be a bit of infection there. I often find that, you know, if you don't treat the infection, even putting the topical steroid on isn't going to settle it down. Don't always, actually. There are circumstances where the topical steroid will settle it down, even if it is infected. Because what the t one of the reasons for that is we all have natural antibiotics on our body surface. Um, they're called cathocidins. And these uh, substances, the, if you've got a real good going bit of inflammation, it may inhibit them. So you put a steroid on, reduce the inflammation, then these normal... Um, uh, antibacterial substances that your skin normally produces can be then produced again. And so steroids can suppress an infected eczema, but you'll, you'll suppress it quicker if you use a, some anti antibiotics as well. Um, so what are you going to do here? How are you going to evaluate it next? You're not going to do a skin biopsy. You might do that. You are going to do that. Oh, I still might do that. Crikey. We've only got to choose one of these. It's only choosing one, I choose this, but let's see what they say. Okay, that's what they want to do. They're saying, we just want help with evaluation. I agree with that. Skin biopsy, not necessarily diagnosed. I agree with that. Um, they're saying, 
large majority of patients with ADR colonize the staph aureus. Treating locally with topical antibiotics is usually not effective. Oh. For localized disease, I don't disagree with that. And I think sometimes using the piristin Bactroban topically will deal with localized flares of atopic dermatitis without sticking them all on antibiotics. Kids react to antibiotics. Um, they may not take the whole course, give them systemic antibiotics, the more likely to get antibiotics um, resistance. So I think if it's localized disease, I think I would use localized therapy. Skin bacterial culture should be considered during hyperacute weepy flares of AD and when pustules or extensive yellow crusts are present. You're going to grow staph. It's just a question of occasionally you'll get um, some kids with an MRSA, either the you know multiple resistant methicillin resistant staphylococcus, either in the community type or heaven forbid if they've been in hospital, the, the more aggressive hospital type. You don't want that. Patients with AD are susceptible to a variety of secondary cutaneous infections, staph and strep, but also viral. Watch for the herpes virus. They're susceptible to that and to some fungal infections as well. Um, they're saying that these bacterial infections are a common cause of atopic dermatitis exacerbations. Yep, they are. That's why I like using Mepiracin, Bactroban. Systemic antibiotics should be used to treat these infections. Not always, my friend, not always. Oh, no, there's a good going. Look at all the crusts there, how red that is. Um, there's oozing from all of this. That is a good going bit of infection there. Um, would I use Bactroban just on that? I might, if it's just on the face. But, you know, if you're starting to get extensive involvement elsewhere, then certainly an oral antibiotic uh, would go more quickly. So some swabs, oral antibiotic, see where you go. What's this case? This time they've got a nine-year-old boy concerned about white spots on his face. Okay, mild asthma, no history of hospitalizations. What about eczema? Has he had any eczema before? Doesn't say so. Just says that he's got mild asthma. So he's possibly atopic. These will be for his uh, airway disease. No known allergies. Mother has had childhood atopic dermatitis, so that's the atopic history in the family. Lives at home with his mother and father. So what have we got there? You got this pale area. Oh, it's not very well defined, is it? Um, you got any thickening of the skin? You can't really tell that. Any scale? You'd actually need to go and scrape that with your fingernail to see if there's any scale. So you'd simply say these are uh, white patches on the skin, poorly defined. Poorly defined hypopigmented scaly patches. Well, you can't tell if they're scaly unless you take your fingernail to that. What's the most likely diagnosis? Pityriasis alba. <clears throat> now that you get in atopics, um, often in the face, often in the summer months when they tan up elsewhere and the little bits where there's low-grade eczema won't tan. Could it be seborrheic dermatitis? Well, you know, it's going to be in the greasy areas and that doesn't look like it. Tinea versicolor, that's a little yeast infection. And it also gives white spots in the sense that it interferes with the normal pigmentation process in the skin. But you usually see it on the back. You don't often see it in the face. You can. Um, so I wouldn't exclude it there. If you really want to be certain, you can take some scrapings. Send that off for a KOH and culture. See what they can come up with. Tell them that you're interested, that it might be tinea versicolor, so that they culture it appropriately. But the KOH will show, the potassium hydroxide examination of it, will show the typical spaghetti and meatballs, you know, the fungal hyphae and uh, the yeast forms there. Vitiligo, that's an autoimmune disease affecting the pigment cells in the skin. Um, usually the color is much whiter in vitiligo than that previous one. And the edges are usually much more defined. Do you know how, do you see how diffuse those edges were before? Well, vitiligo, you can get that. You get very sharp delineation between the area that's uh, got melanocytes in it and the bit that doesn't. So I think that's the diagnosis, vitiliasis alba. 
Yep. Yeah, they're saying that with LIGO. Lesions usually sharply demarc demarcated. Yeah, tinea basica generally doesn't affect the face. It can, though. Um, said um, erythematous patches and plaques with greasy yellowish scale. Yeah, different area. So this is a mild condition. Often asymptomatic. They don't itch. Um, tends to just affect the face. This kid's got asthma, so, you know, this may be his manifestation of atopic dermatitis. Often in young children, often with darker skin because it's more obvious. <coughs> They're saying presenting in spring and summer when normal skin begins to tan. Once you've treated the, um, with moisturizers, and perhaps a bit of that hydrocortisone ointment, then they've got to get out and get a bit of sun on it so that it will uh, tan up again. So, you know, they come back in a week and say, look, look, it's still pale. It simply may be they haven't gone out and got enough sun in it. Use of sunscreens will minimize tanning. Uh, that's true, but some sunscreens can irritate a little bit as well. Moisturization and sunscreen do not improve the skin lesions considered low-strength topical steroids. Look, I'd probably, I'd probably use a wee bit of low-strength topical steroids and hydrocortisone ointment anyway, along with a moisturizer. You want to shut the dermatitic process off, then keep it going with, uh, keep um, moisturizing after that and get a bit of sun in it for the pigmentation to occur, pigmentation to occur. So what are the take-home points? Atopic dermatitis is a chronic, pruritic, inflammatory skin disease with a wide range of severity. It's one of the most common skin disorders in developed countries, yeah, and that's increased a lot recently, from going up from 5 to about 20% of children in Australia and in the USA. I think the figure in adults is higher than that. The distribution of morphology varies with age. <coughs> we talked about that. You know, essentially face and trunk in, in babies, uh, flexural areas in uh, children and adolescents, hands and periocular and face and the like in adults. Last percentage of children with AD will develop asthma or allergic rhinitis. They said 50 to 70, I don't know, what was it? 50 to 80 percent. We want to try and drop that. If we keep, the, if we can get the atopic dermatitis controlled, they'll be less likely to get the asthma and allergic rhinitis. And the pathogenesis is multifactorial. Genetics, you know, disorder of filigree uh, uh, molecule. Skin barrier is impaired. Abnormal T cell response, so they get, they're more likely to get herpes virus, more likely to get poly, uh, the um, Veruca vulgaris. <clears throat> papilloma virus, and remember all these environmental factors that we talked about earlier, the sand pit, the um, bubble bath, the chlorinated swimming pool, all of those things that can irritate the, the skin. And even people that go to gyms and uh, you know do a lot of exercise, the increased skin blood flow can really make the skin flare up a bit as well the excess sweating. Sometimes if they don't sweat normally, the sweat glands will rupture onto the skin and that really irritates the skin and then they rub and scratch them. So they've got to have appropriate clothing on when they're in gyms and this sort of thing. Treatment includes long-term use of emollients and gentle skin care as well as short-term treatment for acute flares. And remember that's topical steroids um, and then the use, once it's settled, the use perhaps of pimecrolimus, elidel or tacrolimus to try and stop flares. Cure inflammation through the topical steroids, true. Treat prioritis for antihistamines, well, you know, I don't agree with that necessarily. Secondary skin infection should be treated with systemic antibiotics, you know, I don't agree with that on every occasion either. I think the person has its place. Identification of true food allergies should be reserved for refractory AD in children in whom the suspicion of a food allergy is high. I think that's fair. Or else yeah, you know, once you get into that area of recurrent food challenges in children, you really need the help of a dietitian to put them on a proper elimination diet first. Um, and if they don't improve within a week, it's not a food allergy. The food allergies aren't going to be major factors. But you're better to get dietary advice if you're going to start restricting major food groups in uh, in young children and young babies. Pityriasis alba is a mild, mild form of atopic dermatitis of the face in children. Yep, I'd accept that. Sunscreen and emollients are the first line treatments. Well, not so sure about the sunscreen. Certainly the emollients, a little bit of 1% hydrocortisone, get some sun on it. 
reassured parents, uh, patients and parents that pitonitis are will fade with time. Well, actually repigment with time, thank you. Okay, look, I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, there may be some elements of that that uh, you may not agree with. That's fine. Have a Do some research on it. Have a little look. Google it. Uh, make your own mind up from the information that's, uh, that's out there. So I'd particularly like to thank the American Academy of Dermatology for producing some of these uh, slides like this. It makes it much easier to give a little video like this or to make one when you've got this material available. Thank you very much.